the Lord says, I not only want to restore what you've lost, I want to restore you. I want to restore your heart. I want to restore your confidence. I want to restore your joy, your peace. I want to make an example out of your life so that other people can say, that's what I want God to do in my life. One word from God can change your life forever. Well, hello, this is Jerry Dearman. Welcome to Two Spies, where we help people possess all the promises of God. Today is an exciting day because we're starting a brand new series that I think you are going to enjoy. It's called The Spirit of Faith. And faith is what causes things in the spirit realm to come into reality in the natural realm and causes things that should not be a part of our lives to be eradicated. And so grab your Bible, open your heart, let's jump into the Word of God and I'll be back at the conclusion to pray with you. This is going to be a series that is going to ignite or reignite a fire of faith inside of your soul that is going to release the power of God to pull you out of circumstances that have adversely affected your life. Some of these truths that I'm going to share with you are truths that I have never taught before and have never seen it quite like this, but I want to share it with you. Can't wait to share it with you. And today I'm only going to be able to introduce it. There's so much that we need to get into that's going to take you up and help you to realize not something special. Listen, this is not something special that the Lord is just giving to the rock right now. This is something that is available to every believer and has been available ever since Jesus was raised from the dead and the power of the Holy Spirit fell on Jerusalem. We're talking about the spirit of faith and we're talking about the way that God wants every believer to live and to confront the adversities of life, to confront and overcome. We are not just conquerors, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so I'd like us to begin by reading 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the 13th verse. This is where the phrase spirit of faith comes from. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Let's all read. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. Stop there. I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. Today I'm only going to be able to introduce this topic and uh, even today you're going to feel so stirred and realize the impact of it in the spirit. Listen down with your spirit. As Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So we're going to introduce it today, but later I want to teach you what the spirit of faith is, how you get the spirit of faith, what it is that makes the spirit of faith work, and what it is in our lives that nullify the spirit of faith, even when we're enacting and implementing the spirit of faith in our lives. We're going to go over all of that, and you're going to see exactly what to do from all over the Bible. The spirit of faith comes from the whole Bible. It, there are people that have this spirit all over the Bible, and this is why they're in the Bible, to show what happens when somebody has the spirit of faith. But today, I want to bring the context of it. I want us to see what Paul is saying, or let's say it this way, from what circumstances Paul is speaking about the spirit of faith, because I think it's very telling and very enlightening to understand where he's coming from. So let me go back and read now. The, the whole chapter, chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5 would give the context, but let me pick it up in verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, listen, beginning at verse 5. Paul said, For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure 
in earthen vessels. Now, when Paul says in verse 7, we have this treasure, he's talking about the light of the gospel. He's saying, listen, we're not out preaching our own ministries. We're not out preaching about ourselves. We're preaching about Jesus Christ. We're preaching the light that has come into this world. Jesus Christ, through his precious word, we're preaching that light. We're preaching that gospel about our God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Let me just sit there for a moment and tell you what he's talking about. When Paul talks about the treasure, he's saying, do you realize what we've received? Do you realize that people all over the world are hastening after something in life and they don't even know what they're going after? They think they know what they want. They think they know what's going to fulfill, what's going to sustain their life. Some are just after basic sustenance. I just need to survive. And they're in the mode of survival. Others are after material things. They're after fulfillment. They're after pleasures. They're after esteem. They're after money. And Paul is saying, do you realize what we've received? That the truth has come to us. The light that there is one Savior and that the whole world is doomed to destruction. But we don't have to be because the light has come into this world, has died for us. And the goodness of the promises of God with a blood covenant backing them has now come into our beings and shown us that we don't have to struggle like everybody else in this world. Amen. We have a God who loves us Amen. and sets us aright and makes sure that we don't fall off the path and be doomed to destruction like the rest of this world. Do you realize what we have? He said, we have a treasure, a treasure. Think about all the treasure hunts that we've seen on movies and television, people after the big chest of gold or, or multiple chests of gold, silver, precious stones, and such. But Paul said, let me tell you something about this treasure that we have. It's in earthen vessels. And the word for earthen vessels there is talking about a very common vessel that was used in that part of the world in that day called a clay pot. And you could have a very expensive vessel of various design and such, or you could have a clay pot, which was really nothing attractive at all. It was just functional. It was a container. It was a repository. And these clay pots were very cheap, and rightfully so, because they were very susceptible to breaking, cracking, chipping, and such. And Paul said, let me tell you what we have. Let me give you the picture of what this was like. He said, we've got the biggest treasure in the world, the truth about Jesus. But God chose, instead of putting it in a beautiful monastery somewhere, he chose to deposit it in clay pots, clay jars. Let me tell you about clay jars and pots. They leak, they chip, they crack, they have defects, and once it's gone into the kiln and the fire is attached to it, once it cracks, it cannot be reshaped. And Paul said, that's what you're looking at, because when you look at me and you look at my body and you look at the frailty, you may not see much that's attractive. He said, but I need you to know what's inside of me is so powerful. What's inside of me is so glorious. What's inside of me will take you up and out and change everything in your life. And for whatever reason... God has chosen to take the most precious thing in the world and put it in the likes of us. Some of us discount ourselves. And we look back at our history and we think about all of our failures, all of our poor decisions or the things that have happened to us, victimized us. And we look at our own chips and cracks and we leak and we can't hang on to truth. And we disqualify ourselves. But Paul said, no, don't disqualify yourself because God has chosen the weak. And God has chosen the foolish. And God has chosen those who have not been wise because he wants the world to see the contrast between what the average human being is 
And this precious treasure that has come into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel about him. And Paul said, this is what it's about. We have this treasure, but we have this treasure in ourselves, in earthen vessels, in clay pots. And he goes on to say that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, that it may be evident to all that the reason these things are happening in our lives are not because we've got the look that everybody wants to know better. It's not because we're so slick and sharp and business savvy. It's not because we're the greatest strategic planners or the most disciplined. But it's because we found the truth. And he, he is in us. And he backs us. And he helps us. And he sustains us. I remember Smith Wigglesworth, who had many miracles in his life. And the power of God was on him so strongly, and it was documented that he raised the dead several times. But he would regularly say, I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. And this speaks to this treasure that we have in us. The treasure that can overcome any, any obstacle, defeat any adversary, and takes broken, chipped, cracked, leaking pots and deposits in them the power and the gospel and the truth that can make any person, any city, any nation free. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And he goes on in verse 8 to say, we are hard pressed on every side. How many sides? Every. every side. Yet not crushed. Somebody tell me why he's not crushed. Because of the treasure inside. Because we've got the truth inside. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Let me say it this way. But they can't get rid of us. Verse 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. He's saying, listen, the death of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus on the cross, he said, as we go and preach the gospel in places that tell us we can't, and as the power of God changes people's lives and and things begin to flourish, persecution begins to come, and they attack us. He said, yeah, we know what the sufferings of Jesus are like. He said, but we carry around the sufferings of Jesus in our body that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. Where is the life of Jesus going to be manifested? In our body. They keep trying to kill me, but they can't kill me because the treasure inside keeps giving life to my body. Listen to verse 11. We who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested where? In our mortal flesh. Verse 12. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. This is the context from which Paul is stating and revealing the spirit of faith. Some would say the spirit of faith, oh yeah, that's Paul. And get the idea that this is some slick minister that has never had any big adversity in his life and he just got this successful ministry and Somehow he got popular, and there are posters of him everywhere, and he's on television, and wow, this guy's just awesome. And so he's preaching a big message, but it's because he's never gone through what I've gone through. And I want you to see, that's not the context of this. The context of this is much adversity. The context of this is Paul said, let me tell you, they've tried to kill me. They tried to take me out. But I got something inside. My body can't sustain it, but something inside keeps sustaining my body. 
Something inside keeps bringing me out of these situations. And it's the treasure of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ inside that keeps saying, I'm going to win. And then he says this, verse 13, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. So wait a minute. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, Okay, well, what is written? Well, what we may not realize is when Paul says, I believe, therefore I spoke, he's quoting from the 116th Psalm, which is why I wanted you to turn there, because I want you to see the context from which Paul is quoting. Psalm 116, and let's begin at the first verse. This is a psalm, by the way, of thanksgiving for deliverance. It's a psalm of David thanksgiving for deliverance. And he says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me, and pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with me. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What does that mean? That means, no, death is not going to overtake me. No, I'm not going to die. I'm going to stay right here walking in the land of the living. Look at it again. Verse 9. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 10. I believed, therefore I spoke. Now this is the context of the psalm from which Paul quotes when he's going through similar adversity that is threatening to completely take him out, take his life, and saying, you're not going to win this one, Paul. You're not going to win this one. And Paul says, listen, we've had it from every side, but it hadn't taken us out. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We've been cast down. We've been thrown down, but we haven't been forsaken. No. And then he says this. Here's how it's going to be with us. Just like the psalmist in Psalm 116, when he was going through it, and it looked like he wasn't going to make it either, he said, I believe, therefore I spoke. He, Paul said, well, we also believe and we also speak. Paul said, I may have some things coming against me, but if God will deliver David, God will deliver me. And here we are reading today what Paul said. And we say, Paul said that the scripture says, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Well, we're reading it today and we say, you know what? Well, we also believe and we're also going to speak. We have an example right here of the Apostle Paul looking into the Scripture for truth, looking into the Scripture for comfort in his own life to find out what will God do for me in my situation. And here's what Paul said. He said, we have the same spirit of faith that David had. And we believe God, and in the face of adversity all around, we're going to speak and say, God will deliver us. God will deliver us. Well, did he? Well, yes, he did. Yes, he did. You know, some people think that Paul, the apostle, when he got that thorn in the flesh, that he just gave in to that thorn in the flesh and just acknowledged defeat. He waved the white flag and said, yeah, Jesus said, I, I can't get over that. I'm just going to succumb to this. Really? 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 Because if that was true, that's different than not only all the rest of Paul's writings, but that's different than the rest of the Bible. But let's look at what Paul said in this same book, 2 Corinthians, but the 12th chapter, beginning at the 7th verse. Paul said, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. A messenger of who? Satan. Who sent that messenger? Was that God? Interesting, when our minds read it, a lot of people say, well, God sent that. 
God sent that because uh, God wanted to keep him from pride. So God said, well, it didn't say God. It said a messenger of Satan, didn't it? A messenger of Satan to buffet him. That means to beat him. Now, why did this happen? Paul said, lest I should be exalted above measure. Verse, verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Well, certainly we can all get in pride. But Paul said, lest I be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. Now, there's something God gave him. God gave him an abundance of revelations. In fact, we don't know anybody in, uh, as an author of the New Testament that had more revelations than the, the Apostle Paul. Even the Apostle Peter, which was the primary apostle in the church of Jerusalem, uh, the first, uh, Peter's the primary character in the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts. And Paul's the primary character in the rest of the book of Acts. But even Peter said in one of his writings, he said, you know those things Paul writes about? Man, those things are, man, they're deep, they're hard to understand. He said, and people try to take it and twist it like they do the other scriptures. And Peter himself verified that Paul was writing scripture. And Peter also verified, man, some of those things Paul's talking about, man, they're hard to get your mind around. Now, why is that? Because Peter walked around with Jesus, and he saw so much of the natural, and it was hard for him to understand everything in the spirit. Paul didn't have that limitation of seeing it all in the natural. Paul went to Arabia, and the Holy Spirit downloaded him the gospel and all the implications of the gospel. And Paul saw it in the spirit, which is always much more accurate. And he didn't have the limitation of seeing it in the natural, walking around with Jesus and thinking you see the truth. And Peter verified, man, he's writing scripture, but some of that stuff, if I could loosely translate it, he said, some of that stuff's even over my head. This is the apostle we're talking about. And Paul said, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of these revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. Now, when it says above measure, what does that mean? I don't hear a lot of people talking about that. Lest I should be exalted above measure. What measure? What measure? Well, don't you remember Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required? That's a measure. To whom much is given, much is required. Equal amount given to e equal amount required. That's a measure. And Paul said, because an abundance of revelation has been given to me, I got an equal amount of adversity. In other words, I'm responsible to use this abundance of revelation in my life. What did Paul get revelation of? All kinds of things, but including the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Didn't Paul get the revelation about the armor of God? When he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Well, that was part one of the spirit of faith. And I'll tell you, this is a life-changing topic from the Word of God. No matter who teaches it, this topic of the spirit of faith is all through the Bible. Great victories have been won because of the spirit of faith and great victories will be won in your life because of the spirit of faith. Now I want to pray right now. I know that you have needs going on in your life. I know that we all need the power of God to come to us. You may be watching and think, I don't even know God. I don't even know Jesus personally. Well, this is a perfect time to receive Jesus and to ask God to bring his power into your life, to eradicate things that should not be there and to bring the blessings of God. And so let's pray together. And if you need to receive Jesus, then pray right along with me. Father, we come in Jesus name and I pray for this person that has needs. It may be physical needs the need for healing, it may be financial needs, the need for financial provision, it may be relational needs, it could be anything. But Lord, according to your precious promises, we invoke the spirit of faith and we say we are going to believe that as we pray that you bring our prayers to pass. We're praying in the name of Jesus that you would supply these specific needs 
that this person is calling out and voicing to you right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, for someone who does not know Jesus, but who prays right now, Jesus, save me. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Lord, I thank you that you hear that prayer and the faith that is behind that prayer causes this person to be born again and to begin a whole new life at a whole new level, at a level of your power. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And friend, I want to tell you, if you're enjoying this study already, you can get this series, The Spirit of Faith. I believe this will be a blessing to your life. You can order it by going to jerrydearman.com or you can call 1-800-544-8000 and we'd be happy to get it right out to you. Or if you go to jerrydearman.com and go to download, you'll find out that you can get this message and in fact the entire series absolutely free. We just want to get it into your hands and into your heart so that your faith can be built and you can receive everything that God has for your life. Well, as always, before I go, I want to remind you that God is always faithful. We'll see you next time. God's will for believers is to confront and overcome the adversities of life because the Bible says we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. In this new series, The Spirit of Faith, Pastor Jerry Dearman will ignite a fire of faith inside you that will release the power of God to bring victory to your life. The Spirit of Faith series contains six powerful messages that will absolutely change your life. This six CD set is available for a gift of $30 or more and the MP3 for a gift of $20 or more. Just log on to jerrydearman.com or call us at 1-800-544-8000 to order this life-changing series today. You can also find dozens of other free teachings online from Pastor Jerry to build your faith in God's promises for you. Just log on to jerrydearman.com and click on the teaching library link. If you would like to support this ministry and help this word continue to spread around the world, become a partner with us today. Please log on to jerrydearman.com. Call us at 1-800-544-8000 or write to us at P.O. Box 4970, Anaheim, California, 92830 to sow your gift by faith today. We're so glad you've joined us today for Two Spies with Jerry Dearman. Our prayer is that you have been inspired to believe that God is always faithful to fulfill His promises in your life. If you have a testimony or prayer request you would like to share, call us at 1-800-544-8000. Write to us at Jerry Dearman Ministries, P.O. Box 4970, Anaheim, California, 92830, or visit us online at jerrydearman.com. If you or someone you know is in the Southern California area, we'd love to have you join us this weekend. The Rock's North Anaheim campus is located at 295 East Orangethorpe Avenue in Anaheim with service times on Sundays at 9 and 11.30 a.m. And our new downtown Anaheim campus, The Rock Forum, is located at 201 East Broadway Avenue in downtown Anaheim with service at 10.15 a.m. and Sunday Night Live at The Rock Forum at 6 p.m. For more information about The Rock or Jerry Dearman Ministries, call 1-800-544-8000 or visit us online at jerrydearman.com.